Hello and welcome back to the frontier. Things are a little different out in this uh, neck of the void and more than a little unstable, but don't worry, get comfy, grab a cup of recaf, the vacuum seal should hold, at least for now. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Fun quotes, but... What does it mean? Well, it means no matter how expansive the universe, no matter how far from home you may go, physics are physics, mass is mass, and engineers never die. Or, well, at least the job doesn't. Welcome to Space Engineers, the physics-based, construction-heavy, open solar system survival crafter. Much like its contemporary cousins in the survival crafting genre, Space Engineers drops you into a sandbox, gives you some starting tools, and some meters to keep track of. Here, however, is where the similarities end. Your gauges don't keep track of hunger and thirst or heat, but oxygen and power. And your final goal is not to build a wood or stone own fortress to collect hordes of resources for gods know what, but to build bigger and bigger ships and platforms. You can build a Death Star if you want, or a cross-planetary set of defense platforms, or hell, a battle cruiser to take the fight to the pirate scum. But to do that, you need a lever, or well, the ships and refineries and construction space to take on such an undertaking. But all of it, all of it is in your reach from the moment you hit start. Every planet and astral body, besides the sun, you can gleam with your human eyes behind a protective visor is a resource. Every stray idea or creative spark jittering around in that brain of yours is a reality waiting to be planned and constructed. So, only one question remains. Where do we start? You take your first steps, like all of us, into this world to find your foot not making contact with anything, and you step in place like a dunce, waving your arms and legs in a zero-g vacuum. Don't worry, we all do it. It's a part of acclimating to the idea that up isn't up and down is just a concept. But what's that? Is, is it getting hot in here? How's that possible without... SFS indestructible, despite having plenty of empty space to fly through with no issue in the grandeur of space, crash lands on an uninhabited alien, but not fully hostile planet. Taking our first steps out of the cockpit, and in my case, infirmary, we take count of our survivors and the ship. For survivors, we have the junior engineer Crispfer, who's skilled in game and experience in this thing we call real life, promised to be useful in our continued survival as a couple of engineers lost on a world god knows where with no help coming. And me, uh, I'm the co-pilot and part-time bartender. Well, I mean, at least I got my optimism. For context, we downloaded a custom start from the absolutely expansive Steam Workshop, which included a couple of minor mods and the scenario where this story takes place. Obviously, we're not starting in the vacuum of space like most starts in this game, but actually crash landing onto an alien world. Linked in the description if anyone is interested. So back to the story. With our two survivors, we then scout the ship. As for the ship, before emergency landing, we had as follows. A Starhopper void ship filled to the brim with fabrication equipment and medical equipment, with spare space only for living quarters. One planetary lander with enough fuel to get into and out of atmosphere with relative ease docked onto the rear end of the ship. And four atmospheric escape pods. Also, one dream. After our emergency landing, we have as follows. A half a ship split into two smaller segments and a crater where the hydrogen in our planetary lander caught fire and, well, destroyed the rear half of the ship. Four escape pods. Oh, wait, sorry. Three escape pods and a new dream. Get off this God's damned rock. After putting out the fires and... <laughs> reconnecting what remained of our fuel and oxygen systems, we took a long look at our new reality, formulating a plan to get us back into zero G where we were most at home and closer to reaching our true home and any projects we wanted to do in the future. The plan, like me, was simple. Fix the ship, strap enough hydrogen thrusters to it to break Atmos, 
and go. We would only have one shot at this though, as the planet we had landed on, despite harboring little to no threats to our well-being, also lacked any and all signs of advanced life. If we scrapped our ship by accident, there would be no backup ship, unless we constructed one from the most base components with hand tools. Not great, very time consuming, but pretty fun if that's your kind of thing. Deciding to make a temporary base, we hunkered down the largest chunk of our remaining ship to the ground and designating it as our temporary home, and we set off. We had a shopping list, you see. Iron, copper, cobalt, ice, silicone, you name it, we need it. But how do we find it? To quote Matt Damon in the film where he needs to get rescued. No, no not that one, the sci-fi one. Not the other sci-fi, there we go. You solve one problem, then you solve the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. So we chopped the head off of our ship and fed it into the patchwork fabricator. We then used the material to craft two smaller vehicles. I set out to create a buggy equipped with an ore detector so I could scout out the nearby hills and mark valuable resources hidden underneath layers and layers of sediments. Well, the actual engineer started work on a much more complex mining rig, which we could use to extract those resources. Setting out for the first time on my custom rig, the unnamed, it darted at incredible speeds up the nearest hill. It was a liberating experience being able to move at such speeds despite being in atmosphere. I located a silicone deposit, loaded up my buggy with what I could mine with my hand tools, and returned home, head held high in my immediate success. Then I found out why you really don't want to go 60 meters a second in atmosphere with ground contact. Oh, bit of a spin. That's all right. We can, we can spin it out. We can't spin it out. <laughs> I repeat, we cannot spin it out. That did not sound good. <laughs> oh, it's spitting rocks. I went 134 miles per hour down a hill with a buggy full of metal. Moving on with the design process, I realized that taking to the air might be the better choice. So I designed a big quote marks here, helicopter to fulfill the same task as the previous vehicle, but this time not crash horribly and glide over the hills instead. Say what you will about my design philosophy, but these two construction projects were up and active long before the mining rig took flight for the first time. Granted, this one also blew up. Well out on a routine scouting flight, I may have just barely bumped the ground, which left the ship in working order, but without one of my maneuvering thrusters. Doing a quick patch job, I found the source of the problem, fixed it up quick, and got back to work, digging and marking locations for eventual pickup. Job done, I hopped back into my chopper, and I found out why you shouldn't do patch jobs when the thing is already working just fine. I couldn't maneuver at all. You see, each of our vehicles has a gyroscope or two in the center of them to give us the ability to shift its weight and turn the vessel in whatever direction we wanted. Basically, it's steering. You got a gyroscope, you can steer your craft. I disconnected mine by fixing the thruster, so I had to watch in horror, and the helicopter maintained its lopsided course flying into the neighboring mountain. Future editor Ben here, um, I forgot to mention that, uh, what actually destroyed it was me destroying the cargo container in the center and spawning a massive amount of metal inside my helicopter, therefore destroying it. Science rules. By this point, CRISPR had finished his abomination and wanted to know where my scout vessel was. Out of spite, I built the simplest, cheapest, in-atmosphere ship I could with the idea that if I broke this one, it wouldn't really matter in the slightest, and I could build another one for really, really cheap. I never crashed it once. This is where I ended the first session. After a short rest, some coffee, and to help the coffee go down, some more coffee, we returned. This time, however, I had a plan. Resource collection was going far too slow for my liking, for two main reasons. Firstly, it took the mining rig far too long to load up, fly back, and maneuver with a full load of heavy material. And second, we still haven't found the rarest of the materials we needed, as they were buried just under the range of our small ore detectors. So I turned to the greatest, the bestest engineers ever conceived for their ancient cockney knowledge. And I decided with utmost 
haste. To quote my master, make it bigger. Going back to square one, I did just that. You see, there are two sizes of blocks in this game. The small ones, which we had been using to make all of our vehicles so far. These cost relatively little resources and allow for fine-tuned customization on a smaller scale, but come with the drawback of fragility and less effective equipment attached to it. Also, you know, they're small. Well, our main ship was made out of big blocks, boasting greater power, greater durability, and of course, a much higher resource cost. But, you know, bigger. So I constructed the behemoth. A colossal land roller with tires the size of my first buggy, cargo space large enough to carry enough material for almost any project we can conceive in a single load, and a sensor array with such a wide range we could pierce all the way down into the rarest material deposits buried deep under the sediments. Also, it was green, it, it was fully solar powered, so much so in fact that once we equipped it with a connector system to dump its resources directly into the base, it would actually fully charge our slowly draining base batteries and kick our assemblers into overdrive with every time we docked it. Of course, it took some time for the design to reach its pinnacle. It's kind of the process of this game. You build a thing, it does the job, you realize that it could do the job a little better, and you add some more stuff to it. We rigged it up so that the mining rig could actually dump its materials straight in without having to manually transfer it all by hand, and then it would obviously automatically dump it straight into the ship once we returned. And the connection to the base well, it was a bitch and a half to get right. Well, the suspension helped me avoid rocks and debris that could have torn the guts out of the thing while going, you know, 90 miles per hour across the hills. They needed to be adjusted every time we needed to load or unload. So we made a system that allowed us to do that relatively easily. Now, the problems of resources out of the way, we could take to our main task in earnest. We shaved chunks off of our impromptu base, replacing walls and panels here and there. Living quarters were thrown out the window, replaced with expanded refining and storage areas. The stern of the ship was designated to be the new bow, since that was the front of the ship previously and had been converted to an impromptu dock and work area. It's, this was kind of a pain to do anything there, so we put it on the other end. Thrusters were added in earnest and hydrogen production went into overdrive. As we expanded the starboard side to expand our fuel storage a multiple of tenfold. And with just the slightest bit of caution holding back just a little bit, we attempted to lift the ship to attach landing gear and detach the ship from the dirt where it had rested. All thrusters were set to 90, 100-ish, and we put the pedal to the metal and center. We didn't even get a meter off the ground. <laughs> Obviously, we were disrespecting our teachers, and the insult would not stand. So, we did what any sensible engineer would do in this case. We doubled the thrusters. On the dawning of a new day, we backed up our other vehicles, just to make sure in case it exploded, and let her rip. Nothing. We racked our brains. Where had we gone wrong? What had we forgotten? Like, why wouldn't the damn thing not lift? Oh. Oh. So, yeah, if you set a construction to be a station inside the video game instead of a ship, it doesn't move. It stays attached to whatever it's docked on. Oops. Ladies and gentlemen, Days later, and looking quite different than when it landed, we have liftoff. The thrusters shook the craft and dust and rust rattled off of undisturbed surfaces to show the clean, relatively uniform work we had invested into our one and only hope of escape. We constructed the landing gear and set about our final preparations. Victory was so close. Our goal was so close we could almost taste the void. But first, we needed ice to process into hydrogen. Without the fuel, we would not get far enough. And secondly, we also needed to take care of our vehicles. The mining rig could easily be attached to the outside of the hull, as well as the secondary one, same deal. Their weight being relatively inconsequential. But the behemoth was a different story. Large blocks are just too much. If we attach the roller to our craft, there is almost no way we would break Atmo. And if we did, it would be worthless without thrusters of its own. So, dust to dust, or well, metal to components, back to metal again, we tore it apart. 
But the behemoth was not dead, just waiting to be reborn once again in a form more fitting to its beautiful free spirit. Scrapping what we could, we did our first test flight. Marking a lake of ice in the mountains, we flew gingerly across the hills and the mountains. The ship flew like a rock you strapped a bunch of fireworks to, but it did the job. Guided in by Chris, I landed the ship and we went to work, ripping up as much of the ice as we dared, weighing the ship down bit by bit, but with each pound we gained, it was straight fuel, and we would need that for an extended flight. Finally, in the end, we did not leave this planet being chased off by this world. We left of our own accord, triple checking all systems, double checking the hull, and casting a prayer or two out to the unknown universe. We strapped in, switched on, and took our last breath of natural air. The thrusters shook the ship once again, but we knew it would hold. With utmost confidence, I pointed the nose up and let the ship do exactly what it was designed to do. Our skin pulled at us and our stomachs stayed behind as the absurd thrust pushed us higher and higher into the atmosphere. The blue of the sky began to dissipate, being replaced with countless stars and empty void. Asteroids, undisturbed for millennia, orbited the planet as we passed them by, utilizing our momentum to its fullest reaching further and further away. Then, we slowed our advance, came to a stop, and released our harnesses. There we floated, with no gravity, no air besides in our sealed hull. We were free, freer than ever before. Planets shined in the distance while massive clusters of asteroids floated around us. The solar system was ours for the taking. The only question that remains, the one question that always remains, is where to start. That's it, we done. Thank you so much for watching. Space Engineers is honestly a solid game and I've been playing it on and off for a couple of years now, but finally got an excuse to hop back in and really give it another good go. I am happy to be giving you a taste of it, really. Granted, the game isn't perfect. Distance is a bit weird and gravity doesn't really work like gravity should with planets and stuff, but the zero G experience and the crafting is more than enough for you to play this game. It is awesome. Awesome. If you want a truly unique experience of, of being in space and building stuff and crashing into other stuff and making decisions and making mistakes, give it a try. But with that, that'll be it. I'm done for today. As always, I am nobody, and I will see you wherever our stories may lead.